So maybe some questions would be good, quickly. Some comments, yeah. Um, considering who you're working with in the community, how did you get that initial group interested in technology and saying, look, I want to go do this, considering that they have careers elsewhere, um, not a shape of the better society, but they still had income. How did you get them to come to you or to join up and say, look, because um, the exposure to technology is only half the equation. What was the incentive, incentive for them to come and sit down and say, I am going to do, spend my time doing this instead of going out and running my prostitution rate? Good question. Um, we worked with an NGO that already worked in the community with a group of people. So when, we, when they came to us, they were already on the program with them for six months. So we identified an organization on the ground right, that's working in the community. And I mean, I come from the community, so I know the setting very well. And basically the idea was that how can we actually work alongside them, partnering with the university, actually to open and empower these people. And it wasn't about training, that computer training wasn't what we sold them. What we sold, the, our selling point to them was, listen, you've got a story. Everybody's got a story to share. And it was all about sharing stories about them. And that storytelling became a key driver for learning, a key driver for innovation. So we actually use storytelling to drive learning. So for example, um, if there's someone that comes and they share a story, oh, this is what I've been through. We say, wow, that's amazing. So do you know that you can actually take your, 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 your cell phone, you can take a video clip, and then we show them that you can share that story with a wider audience. In that process, they learn a skill without them knowing this, but they actually learn is something that could be very valuable. Of course, eventually after that, we found that this whole kind of social and new media thing just caught on with people. So, it's, so we worked with an organization in the community called Impact IA, who was already doing the amazing work in that city. So all we did, we basically said, listen, at least now this is our approach. We partner with organizations. So we don't go and start something from scratch. We actually work with organizations with groups of people that's already doing that type of work, doing work in the community that see this kind of social innovation, social entrepreneurship angle as a big value add to what they're already doing. And that is basically our partnership that we So of course in this city it's, it's going to be completely different. Uh, for example, in, we, we're starting something in Nigeria, uh, in the Niger Delta. And they were working in an organization that worked with youth related to HIV. So what we're basically doing, we're taking a different approach. Um, so we're looking at what's the local problems or the local tension. So what we talk about, we talk about community's intention. So it's, when I talk about community, it's not just the, um, geographically. It's not just your location. We actually, because for example, if you're someone that's poor or someone who's wealthy, if you're affected by, let's say, HIV and AIDS, that tension actually can draw you together. If you want to come up with a solution of how you can support someone, no matter who you are, that problem can actually bring you together as a community. So that is what we use to draw people together. I mean, in our case, it just so happened it's not to and stuff. So it's finding community organizations and groups of people that are champions on the ground. <clears throat> um, so what I want to know is what you guys at Arabs have like um, are you guys having some professional trainers or such people who um, train those people from the game yeah and become like professional programmers because as you say um, that person with Jamie X you said previously didn't have a good background but later on you can have like an advanced so what happened? I mean, were you um, <coughs> creating some sessions and classes where you teach those people? We, we run an academy where we teach programming, we teach all the technologies. But it's not always done by professionals. What we do is, we, our, our approach to, to teaching is this. We want to teach you so that you don't need me anymore, so that you can become better than what I have. You can go and teach. So the idea is basically that uh, we, we try to equip someone so that 
so that that person could possibly take my place. Then I can do something different, something bigger. So it's, 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 it's that kind of approach. So that's why I said when I taught, I only taught the first group. I was the first person that did the teaching, and that was only to 14 of them. Everything else was done by them. They arranged it. So if there's a certain skill that's needed, they will go and find that skill and open it. So for example, we did the mobile development. <coughs> Sorry, and with the development, we found people in industry that owned those kind of companies to come and do the initial thing. And then once they've done it once, then our guys can take it forward with the support from the industry people. So within Jamex, we actually employ six full-time developers. Some that come from the community, others that come from the university. So there's a mixture we work with. We partner with different types of organizations um, and companies because the network is a very important component. I also have another question. How do you base um, Medistay from having a very low quality computer like that one which is the um, mobile data connection here yeah, after having those laptops. What made you guys have that kind of state? Oh, how did you go? Yeah, yeah. From having only one computer to having yeah, those kind of laptops. Yeah, we we basically what we did was we we realized that of course as the interest group we needed more computers. We used, we used the computer lab at the university, but that was only available twice a month. When, the, when more people wanted to learn, we didn't want to chase them away. So initially what we did, I would go to everybody that I know to ask them if they can borrow me a computer. So you can imagine, every Friday I would go and I would drive, pick up a box, not laptops only, towers, having to set it up, and take it back to them after the two hour session. It was a huge job. And that we realized that maybe we didn't see if we can't get some computers that might make it a bit easier when we do the program instead of having to go back and forth in time. So that happened over time. We only got the computers in our second year of running. And now we basically buy, make a decision that every year we want new computers. We want to make sure that the community members learn on a new laptop. You know, we want to create, create a space like this where we can feel it must be an environment where you can learn. So that we very much talk about that. Because it's not about the technology. I think you touched on that that is secondary. It's about people coming together, caring about other people. But we see that technology can play an enabling role in making facilitating change. So people now are coming up with ideas, developing apps, and it's not, it doesn't take a year to launch, we launch it within a few weeks. Because we're already in the community, the people understand the problem, and that's easy to, to, to reach it out. So that is something else that you need to learn. It's not about creating an amazing technology there, and then trying to chase a client. Living Labs is where you do it in an environment with people, for people. You can launch quickly, learn from it, and there's something that they call a minimum viable product. Even if it just does one feature very good that people need, launch it. 